So the next talk, um, just a little bit on the basics of organic certification transition. Um, since the next two of our speakers, uh, Wade Fisher and Nate Pellapong, um, are either in transition to organic or certified organic farmers, we thought it'd be helpful just to kind of touch on what what is certification, how does it work, some of the terms involved in that. If it's something you're curious about or um, have heard of, and are just kind of wondering what that looks like. Um, and again, Claire Keene, formerly here in Williston, and then now uh, over with Plant Science Department in Fargo. So this talk, um, the origins of organic certification, uh, kind of where did the process come from here in the US, and then answer those questions, how does certification work, what is transition, some key organic regulations to know, and then just a, a quick FAQ at the end. Um, and I forgot to bring them up here with me, um, but in the back, we do have some resources um, if you're interested, which I will point out a couple now and a couple later. Um, there are these orange books that are from the Midwest Organic Association. Um, they're really great, just quick intro, kind of what I'm going over here in a little more detail. Um, things about transition and certification, uh, things to think about if you're considering organic. And then also these organic transition planners are really great. Um, a lot more detail, a lot of worksheets that folks may find helpful. Um, things like just thinking about, you know, what are your goals for your operation? Um, you know, why do you want to be organic? How close are you already to organic possession, uh, production? Sort of self-assessments of things you're already doing or what you might change. Um, and also some really great case studies of an organic systems plan, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. But part of the organic certification process in the US is having this pretty comprehensive document of what is your operation? What do you do? How you do it? And that's called the organic systems plan. And this book has some examples of different operations across the country of that in the back. So kind of a good starting point on that. And there's also books back there, Crop Rotation on Organic Farms. May I hold up yours? Yeah, I'll come back the room. Um, this is a really great book, um, whether you're interested in organic or not. Um, it does come out of the Northeast, so it's pretty heavy on like organic vegetable production, but it has the best tables that I've ever seen. Um, in terms of thinking through crop rotations for things like disease management, uh, residue management, um, insect pest management. Again, it's kind of heavy on the fruit and vegetable side, but there are a couple of grain farmers in here um, who have their example rotations and kind of walk you through why they do what they do. So this is a great book. If you're a home gardener, it can also serve that purpose. And then this book, Managing Cover Crops Profitably, um, again, whether you're organic, conventional, is curious about cover crops, really great resource. Um, it's a thick book because it walks through a bunch of different species and has pages on oats, buckwheat, fava bean, um, sweet clover, hairy vetch, triticale, rye, kind of almost any cover crop you could think of, like a profile page. And then again, the best charts I've ever seen on trying to help you figure out what do these cover crops do well. So these diagrams of like, if you're looking for things that grow quickly to help prevent soil erosion, or you're trying to compare legumes for what produces a lot of nitrogen, um, these kind of help you walk through species selection. So a really valuable resource uh, for folks thinking about cover crops. Thank you. Okay, thanks Kelly. All right, so just quickly, when did organic start? Um, you know, it's, some people like to think about, well, anything pre-synthetic fertilizers and pesticides was organic by default. And that's kind of true. Um, so synthetic fertilizers, uh, particularly nitrogen, just that chemical process of converting atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia was discovered about 1910. Um, it was first commercialized, we'll put commercialized in quotes, but put into wide use during World War I to make munitions, primarily in Europe. And then during World War II, we produced a lot of ammonia to make munitions around the world. Um, yes, to, to go into the war effort in both Europe and the US. And agricultural fertilizers really weren't widely available until post-World War II. So in the grand scheme of agriculture, you know, um, synthetic fertilizer and then later uh, petroleum-based herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, 
you know, really weren't in use until the last um, 70, 80 years. Um, on that line of thinking, you did have some folks um, first kind of in Europe, but then also in the US, just wondering, you know, what did synthetic fertilizers do to the soil? Some people concerned about, you know, was there an impact on the environment? And then some people just really concerned about this idea of cost, fertilizers and inputs representing a big new cost for farmers that they never had before. And so some of the first movers and shakers in the organic world um, arose just from questioning these new inputs. Um, in the US, um, the interest in organic agriculture and thinking about that as just farming without synthetic inputs, um, Caught on first in the 1940s, there was a guy named J.I. Rodale in Pennsylvania who published the Organic Farming and Gardening magazine, and that was pretty widely available. Um, and he was bringing some of those ideas from Europe uh, to the US. And then in the 60s and 70s, there were a number of things that got people kind of interested in organic, um, whether it was the back to land movement and you had uh, younger people from urban areas and suburban areas moving out into the countryside. Um, and wanting to, to farm without synthetic inputs. Um, you also had the oil crises of 1973 and 1979, um, when OPEC put an embargo on selling oil to the US and petroleum prices spiked and fertilizer spiked and you had some farmers um, just wanting to get away or needing to get away from the high cost of those inputs. Um, and then also in kind of the 60s and 70s, as organic agriculture, excuse me, as organic production kind of caught on in Europe, um, that created just some high value market opportunities. You had some organic farmers in the US or farmers in the US wanting to get um, organic production going at a scale that they could access those higher value European markets. So kind of a lot of different threads creating organic. And the, the take home point of this slide though, is organic certification preceded legislation in the US. So you had around the country, these different groups of farmers wanting to put, you know, define organic so they could put that on their product, again, primarily to go to European markets. Um, but as interest in organic grew among US consumers, then they found value for that um, for domestic products as well. And so the first group I'm aware of, uh, California Certified Organic Farmers or CCUF, started in California in 1973. And then just a cool thing, we here in North Dakota had one of the first uh, organic certifying agencies. Uh, Fred Kirschman in Medina, North Dakota, started Farm Verified Organic in 1979. They changed names to International Certification Services, and they're still based out of Med Medina, and they're one of the bigger <coughs> certifiers of operations up here in the upper Midwest. Next slide, please. So, okay, the national. So this USDA organic symbol that's out there now and very widely recognized um, has been in existence for less than 20 years. So that is pretty new. So even though there, there has been organic certification around um, since the, the 70s, roughly in the US, there wasn't a standard for that at the national level. Each certifying agency had their list of what was and was not allowed in organic production. And it was very much locally controlled, usually groups of farmers and agronomists um, associated with those certifiers made the rules for what CCOF for FVO verification meant. But as, again, as the export market grew, as domestic consumption of organic products grew, um, there was growing consensus that, well, we should have a national regulation to define organic. So that way, everybody is on a level playing field. Consumers, whether they're domestic or foreign, know what they're getting. And so the first organic rule uh, was actually written in 1990, but it took 10 years of wrangling within the USDA um, to get it into a format that would actually be approved. So a pretty long lag time. And the National Organic Program um, was officially launched in 2000. So again, a, a pretty recent thing in the grand scheme of things. And I'll be referring to the NOP a lot. And NOP, again, it's just National Organic Program, and that's the actual law. Those are the codes that govern what is and is not allowed in organic production in the US. And then the accredited certifiers, um, the USDA accredited certifiers for the first time in 2002. So again, that USDA organic symbol, even though it's pretty ubiquitous now, has only been in existence for about 19 years. So what is organic certification? So I mentioned it's production practices that comply with the NOP. 
And organic certification is granted by organic certification agencies, AKA organic certifiers. So I'll use those terms interchangeably. It's, um, it's an important point to know that because so it's not actually the USDA that is out there certifying a farm as you know, compliant with organic or in violation of organic production or not. It's the USDA essentially outsourced that job to organic certifiers. And so the organic certifiers are um, agencies, some are for-profit, some are non-profit, um, that are uh, responsible for enforcing the NOP with farmers that are seeking organic certification. Um, and then the organic certifiers employ or contract organic inspectors, and it's the inspectors who would actually go to your farm and conduct the audit, look at your records, talk with you about your production practices, and make sure you're in compliance with the organic regulations. And so the certifiers, um, this isn't an exhaustive list. I just wanted to kind of give you a taste of um, the fact that there's, there's many out there, and you as the farmer have full control over who you want to pick. And so it's really important who you pick because they need to fit um, fit with you on, you know, do they have the customer support you want? Do they, are they familiar with your production practices? Do they have resources that'll be valuable to you? And also fees. Um, there are fees associated with organic, um, not only the yearly inspection, but maintenance, or sorry, the initial certification, then ongoing annual uh, certification. So finding someone whose fee scale works for you is also really important. Um, so I mentioned international certification services. They're based out of Medina. Um, many folks up here use them. The Organic Crop Improvement Association is based out of Lincoln, Nebraska. They also certify a lot of acres in the upper Midwest. Uh, the Montana Department of Ag actually has their own certification program um, and it is state-based. So you have to be a Montana producer with acres in Montana to get certified through the Montana Department of Ag. I mentioned CCOF in California. You might see MOSA occasionally out here, uh, the Midwest Organic Services Association, they're based in Wisconsin. Um, and something to know about certifiers is that with the exception of a state-based program, which I think only Montana and Colorado that I'm aware of have those through their departments of ag, the others can certify your operation regardless of where you are. So you don't have to be in California to get certified by CCOF. You don't have to be in Wisconsin to get certified by BOSA. Um, and, and on the one hand, that's because you know, from the audit and on-farm standpoint, they're contracting with an inspector who will get on a plane or make the drive to go wherever in the country they need to go um, to actually do that on-farm component. Um, but then also when picking your certifier, make sure you have one that has experience in your area. So like MOSA, you know, they're, their wheelhouse is organic dairy. They work a lot with organic dairy farmers in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Ohio. Um, CCOF, probably the most experienced in the country working with vegetable and fruit growers. Um, but you know, out here, we're not doing too much organic fruit and vegetable production. Uh, we're doing large scale grain. And so OCIA, ICS, um, Montana Department of Ag would have good experience in those, those production systems. So the steps, the first step with again, organic certification, I definitely encourage you just to think about um, your market and identifying your market. Um, sort of as Shauna was saying, it's like, you have to think ahead, you know, what are the products you have available? What is it you wanna do? Who are your end users? Um, and ask yourself, is organic certification needed? Because again, it's cost, it's a process. Um, if you're able to do a direct consumer thing like Shauna and her family are doing without organic certification, then I think, I mean, that's awesome. That's, that's a really unique channel. Um, if you're just use the example, you know, a small scale market garden to sell directly to, to folks at a farmer's market, you probably don't need to go through the hoops of organic certification and the consumer is able to interact with you directly. But at the scale we're at out here, you know, you're looking to sell thousands, if not tens of thousands of bushels of grains, pulses, oil seeds, then you're gonna need organic certification because any mill or crush or buyer at that scale, for them to have organic products at the end of the day, they need someone who's organic certified to buy from. So um, selecting your organic certifier uh, is very important. I mentioned consider, consider the level of support provided. So do they have example forms and record keeping assistance that you can access? Like do they maybe have a discount on a on-farm record keeping software program or do they partner um, to help make that process easier with anyone? 
Um, access to technical support. So the certifying agency, depending on just their structure, they may have um, sometimes agronomists, but sometimes like experienced farmers that are kind of on, on staff or on retainer with them that are available to take other farmers' phone calls with questions. Um, because they, those inspectors who visit your farm, even though many of them are extremely knowledgeable about organic practices, they can't recommend um, or tell you how to farm or tell you how to do something different or recommend different practices because their job is to be there to make sure you're in compliance. It's not to consult on your farming operations. Um, but, you know, you may have an organic certifier who has those kinds of people on staff that you can call when you have questions. So is that something you want? Customer service, obviously, how responsive are they? Do they have access via phone or text or email or whatever your preferred methods are? And then of course, fees. Um, so you've selected a certifier, you'd start the process and transition. Uh, part of that is creating and maintaining the organic systems plan. So again, an organic systems plan is this document. It's an evolving document, it's not set in stone, but the idea of it is to lay out what are the crops or livestock you produce? How do you produce it? Um, estimates of you know how much you're gonna have each year. What kinds of channels are you selling them through? And that OSP is considered really core to your organic um, certification process because an inspector will be looking at it and referencing it um, when they come to do your uh, certification. Um, apply for certification. So you've done the transition. Apply for certification, you undergo your inspection and review, and if everything's found to be in good order, um, then you'll, you'll be certified, and you are literally issued a certificate of certification by your certifier, and then that document, um, most buyers are going to ask for a copy of that. So you're selling them organic flax, or you're selling them organic wheat, um, they'll want not only your wheat, but they'll also want a copy of your organic um, certification uh, document. And so how much does it cost? So again, it depends on the certifier. They all have their own fee schedules. Um, keep in mind that initial upfront fees are higher than the ongoing fees because you'll have that initial application fee, um, potentially a higher fee upfront because that initial audit and inspection is pretty in depth. But then ongoing, your annual inspection fee and annual certifications. Uh, some certifiers vary uh, those fees with the size and the complexity of the operation. So, for example, if you're an organic grain farmer, um, you know, there's, call it level one of what that costs. But if you also grow grain and are raising certified organic beef cattle, that's another layer to the operation. There'd be all those records associated with the cattle. Um, so that'd probably be another fee um, because you have a more complex operation. Some do sort of a sliding scale, so based on your gross sales of organic products. Um, the ballpark uh, number I've been using for a year or two for small to medium-sized farms um, in the $500 to $2,000 a year kind of range. Um, the USDA FSA does actually have a national organic certification cost share program that'll pay 50% of your certification fees um, up to $500, so that's a very good resource. If you're a North Dakota resident, the North Dakota Department of Ag also has an organic cost share program of their own that'll cover 75% um, of fees up to $750 a year for three years, so a little bit better um, than the federal one. Uh, but do be aware, no double dipping. If you're doing the North Dakota organic, excuse me, <coughs> North Dakota um, State Department of Ag uh, program, then you can't also do FSA. But I would recommend if you're in North Dakota, you know, start out with the ND Department of Ag because it's $250 more, and then you can shift over to FSA after that third year. So land, so what is transition? I've mentioned that a few times. Um, transitioning to organic means that there's a 36 month period or three years um, between your last application of a prohibited substance. And so prohibited substance, things you can't use in organic production. So whether that's urea, or MAP, or DAP, or glyphosate, or paraquat, um, or even a growing maybe a GMO corn variety. Um, so from 36 months of the last application of that thing, or in the case of say planting the GMO crop um, from your field, then the clock starts and 36 months after that, you can harvest your first certified organic product as long as you've done it with compliant organic standards between that last date 
and then harvest with the next crop. Oh, sorry, could you advance the slide? Mm -hmm. Yep, Sorry. that's okay. Um, yeah, so it's a 36 month period. You have to use the organic production practices during that period, but you can't sell it as organic. And so that does represent usually a pretty substantial financial cost for a lot of folks. Um, and so that's, you know, acknowledging it for what it is a really big barrier um, to transition for a lot of people. There are methods to deal with that. Certainly putting in alfalfa and growing it for three years and not spraying it um, is a great way to transition to organic. It's not for everybody. Obviously, forages have to cash flow in that operation for you, and you have to be willing to make hay and deal with it or find someone who is. Um, but that is a way to, to get over that hump. Um, farmers are on that learning curve during transition and after. Um, so after that 36 months have gone by, <coughs> uh, your certifier, um, you'd hopefully be in conversation with them at the start of your transition. Uh, after that 36 month period, You'll have your review, record keeping and documentation, the organic systems plan being reviewed and approved. And if everything's good, then you are certified at that point. And now anything harvested off of that land in the future, as long as you know being grown in compliance with organic rules, will be eligible to be a certified organic crop. And again, though, during that certified period, it's not one and done. Unfortunately, there will be annual inspections and fees. So keep that in mind. You do have to continue to maintain your records and update that OSP. Um, the law says you have to re retain your records for a minimum of five years. Um, and then, of course, you know, implementing a crop rotation that meets the market demands and then maintains soil fertility and minimizes pest problems. There is an exception. So if your land was in CRP or pasture and no prohibited materials were applied for the past three years, um, there, there is a, an exception that you could say, break it out and plant a crop and have it be certified organic in the first season. Um, each certifier has a little bit of different process for this and what kind of documentation they need. Um, typically at the, at the minimum level, they'll ask for some kind of affidavit or, um, you know, a written description of how this was managed, if it had a previous landowner, you know, what did they do or not do to it in the past three years, um, so that that gets signed off on. Okay, so the actual, um, just a really small slice of what's a very big piece of, of legislation, um, NOP section 205-105 um, does define allowed and prohibited substances. So here's where synthetic substances and ingredients are um, excluded from organic production. There are some exceptions. Um, however, a lot of those exceptions are things like sanitation products that are okay to use to like clean out equipment. Um, copper, oh, what is it? Copper sulfate is a fungicide that's allowed um, in organic production, um, fruit and vegetable. It doesn't really get used in agronomic crops much. There's some Things like that, also plastic row covers, again, not really applicable to grains, but allowed in fruit and vegetable production. So um, that list of um, allowed and prohibited is there. Um, I would definitely recommend going with a certifier who has um, a user-friendly approach to allowed and prohibited substances. Because maybe you, know, you hear about a new fertilizer product you wanna try um, or you're interested well, I know cattle, sometimes it can be an issue if you have treated wood to use in a fence post in a pasture, what's your certifier's approach to that? Um, having a certifier that you can call to ask about allowed and prohibited substances just to make sure you're always on the up and up is really helpful. And then there is the thing called the Soil Fertility and Crop Nutrient Management Standard that again, it's also part of the law. And I would say <laughs> there's, there's maybe a love-hate relationship with this part, um, so on the one hand, it states, the producer must select and implement tillage and cultivation practices that maintain or improve the physical, chemical, and biological condition of the soil and minimize soil erosion. And so that is something certifiers can use. So say, you know, organic definitely has the wrap of using a lot of tillage. And are we, you know, losing our soil to erosion if we do organic agriculture? Which certifiers are empowered, if you want to look at it that way, um, to, to I was going to say to keep in check, I don't know if that's quite accurate, but to call producers out on practices that would lead to, say, excessive soil erosion. Um, be a longer conversation, but, you know, doing things like strip cropping, 
um, rotating with perennials, using cover crops, all those things that we know are good for just keeping soil from moving. Um, those practices aren't spelled out and required, but if say you're farming on marginal ground or steep slopes and you have a lot of erosion issues, that is something a certifier could potentially call you out on because you know, you're causing excessive erosion. But again, the problem then is that because how you should address it is not defined, it also leaves um, a lot of openness to interpretation. So most certifiers are you know, interested in you maintaining your natural resource base, which would be the, the spirit of this, um, but actually how it's carried out um, for each individual producer does, does vary. Um, and then the second part, producer must manage crop nutrients and soil fertility through rotations, cover crops, and the application of plant and animal materials, which includes manure. Um, and that, that one is such that it, it's kind of reinforcing the pr prohibition of synthetic substances, you know, um, using uh, crop rotation, legumes, cover crops, animal manures, compost, things like that for soil fertility rather than um, other inputs. However, you know, things like fish meal, bone meal, um, other products, you know, those are allowed in organic agriculture, but something to keep in mind, again, just at our scale and growing grain crops, a lot of those products are often really expensive. And especially if they're coming from really far away, they may not be economical to use in uh, row crop production. And so again, really relying on that crop rotation is integral to, to organic production over time. For livestock, um, could you advance please? Um, I'm definitely not a livestock expert either on the conventional or organic side, but I just wanted to point out um, that transition period for livestock depends on the, the class of livestock or species. So poultry under continuous organic management beginning no later than the second day of life. So you don't necessarily have to get your chickens or turkeys from a certified organic hatchery. Um, they can come from anywhere. You just have to start managing them organically um, second day of life or after hatching. Meat animals under continuous organic management since the last third of uh, gestation. And could you advance to the next slide, please? Yes, and some key organic livestock rules I'll start with the feed first. So organic livestock, whether it's chickens or beef cattle or dairy cattle, um, a, certainly a challenging part of it is that the total feed ration does need to be certified organic um, feed. So whether that's um, you know bringing in corn or soybean meal or forages, hay, grazed pastures, those all need to be certified organic if the meat, eggs, or milk from those animals are going to be sold as certified organic. Um, with the life, livestock healthcare practice standard, I put the vaccines are allowed, antibiotics are not up at the top. So vaccines are allowed, antibiotics are not, which you might hear the criticism out there of, oh man, organic farmers, you know, if a cow gets sick and needs antibiotics, are they compromising that animal, animal's welfare by not treating it with something that works, you know, just to maintain its <coughs> organic status. They should not do that. If they do that, that would be in violation of um, 205-238. That a producer of organic livestock must not withhold treatment from a sick animal, so that number seven, in effort to preserve its organic status. So if an animal needs antibiotic treatment or other treatment that would not be in compliance with organic standard, the rule isn't don't treat that animal. The rule is treat it as appropriate but then just make sure it's separated and would not go into an organic marketing channel. So say you have your organic beef herd, um, the calf has an issue, you use antibiotics. You don't have to dispose of that calf. It's just, you can raise it, but just make sure it gets marketed, um, not, not represented as organic. So if you go into a normal sale barn channel. Um, the pasture practice standard uh, was added in 2010. So organic rules are, you know, being updated. Um, it's, it's essentially that ruminants must have access to pasture, but again, there's flexibility here depending on where you are in the country because they realize obviously there's going to be a whole lot more grazing days available to someone in Georgia than there's going to be in North Dakota. And so um, the pasture practice standard, it's basically ruminants must have access to pasture at appropriate times during the year, um, but then also I think it specifies 30% of their dry matter intake needs to come from forages, whether that's grazing or harvested. And that, that was really in, in response to some of the really large organic dairies um, that have, 
that have been created um, in Colorado, Texas, and California primarily, where you do have um, pretty close to confinement type situations for, for very large organic dairies. Um, and that really makes the small organic dairy farmers in Minnesota and Wisconsin unhappy. And um, the pasture standard was trying to incorporate um, some rules there to, to ensure um, cows being have a more forage based diet and then also access to, to pasture. Um, a quick thing on organic meat. If the organic meat you buy has that USDA organic symbol on it, um, it does require being slaughtered in an organic certified facility. And this is a really big barrier to organic beef production in the upper Midwest. We just don't have very many slaughterhouses that are certified to do organic beef. Um, there aren't any currently operating in North Dakota that I'm aware of. Um, I heard that, I can't remember if it was Hazen or Glenn Allen, but somebody um, has recently applied to start a small state inspected facility and they'd like to do organic slaughter. So we might have one on the way in North Dakota. There's only one that I'm aware of in South Dakota. Montana does have three. And actually our afternoon speaker, Nate Powell Palm, does organic beef production in the Bozeman area. And I think it's still water, yeah, still water packing that he goes with. Um, and it's really funny. I've had the question, it's like, what makes it organic slaughter? Are there special knives? And the answer is no. Um, the organic certification of a slaughter facility is mostly just about separation of the organic livestock and then organic products um, as they go through that process. So the gentleman, I don't remember his name, but I know I called Pioneer Meats um, and the owner of that facility was really happy to talk to me and he said, yeah, the way we do it, because they do both organic and conventional, basically just start the week with organic. They, they'll do all their lots on Monday or Tuesday, whenever it is when they start up slaughter do all the organic first. They have separate coolers for the organic meat and products coming off those cows. And then they can just move right on into conventional. The problem is the cleaning in between. If you were to say, start with a conventional lot of cows and then an organic lot comes in, you'd have to totally clean down the facility before you can start the slaughter. So it's not really about how the cow is killed or what it's used. It's just separating those organic raised livestock from, from not. And so some common FAQs, crops, we touched on how long is transition, 36 months, less if you didn't have prohibited materials applied. Does seed need to be certified organic? Um, the answer to that is that you must attempt to use certified organic seed um, and high cost of it is not an excuse. However, if say, if you're growing corn or soybean, a maturity um, that you want is not available as certified organic seed, you are able to use conventional untreated seed um, and, and certifiers accept that. However, I would caution, check if that's acceptable to your buyer. There are some buyers who might want to say, we only wanna buy you know, soybeans grown from certified organic soybean seed. Do you need buffers around fields in most situations? Yes. So again, the idea of um, not only, uh, you know, say con genetic contamination, but also pesticide drift, um, buffers are required around organic production fields. Uh, it's not specified in the regulations, how big those are or what they need to look like. 30 feet is kind of a common um, number that's out there. Some farmers I've spoken with, uh, a man in South Dakota, what he does if he has his organic soybean field and a neighbor has conventional soybeans right next to him, which happens quite a lot. Um, he likes to use a 50 foot buffer that he plants to I think oat and pea and then he uh, hays it in the middle of the summer. And that's the, the physical barrier between the conventional and the organic crop. Uh, are GMO crops allowed? No. Are split operations allowed? Yes. So you can manage, say you have a 2000 acre operation. If a thousand are certified organic and a thousand are conventional, that's just fine. Um, in Canada, I can't remember what the limit is, but it's something like after two or three years, you either have to be all organic or, or not at all. They don't allow split operations. Whereas here in the US, that's, that's fine. On the livestock side, vaccines allowed? Yes. Antibiotics? No. Growth hormones? No. Does feed have to be certified organic? Yes. Again, including grain, hay, forages, and grazed pastures. And then the welfare standards, um, livestock living conditions, uh, the ruminants must have access to pasture. And the living conditions one, the key thing there is all livestock must have access to outdoor 
to the outdoors and sufficient space for natural behaviors. So that's excluded some things like battery cages and instant egg production. Um, you know, but that's not to say, again, there are now some very large um, organic chicken and turkey houses at different places in the country where those animals, you know, you can call it confinement. They're still raised like mostly indoors in a barn, but those animals aren't in individual cages. It's sort of a communal um, open space. And with that, I will take any questions. I'm curious, you mentioned the soybeans. So a neighbor has, say he has GMO soybeans in their dicamba mm -hmm. resistant. And say the guy plants a 50 foot barrier of feed milks. Dicamba can travel two to three miles. So how is that managed or what, is there any testing done or is that just, how does, how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So let's go with non-dicamba first. Okay. And then dicamba's throwing a whole new wrench into it. Right, so his name's Charlie Johnson, Madison, South Dakota. Um, if you're someone looking for organic corn, soybean, forages information, he's um, really easy to talk to. Um, anyways, so Charlie, so before dicamba beans, if he had his organic soybeans, neighbor has conventional, it would happen occasionally that the co-op or you know, new hired hands, someone got lost and sprayed some of his field. Um, he worked with a certifier who rather than say, take that whole 40 acres or 80 acres or whatever out of compliance, they would, if they could define, you know, where, where it got sprayed that it wasn't supposed to take that out of um, certified status. And then Charlie, he has beef cattle. So he usually just plant it to alfalfa or something for three years. And for the most part, his neighbors, um, good working relationships with neighbors as an organic farmer um, is usually pretty critical. Um, he's been doing it for over 30 years. So folks in his area uh, know, and he's usually able to work out an arrangement either with the co-op or the neighbor about lost production value on organic corn and soybean for the next three years. Um, and sorry, and the key thing there was that they, they'd take a, they'd take what they need to out of compliance rather than like the whole field. And that would be something to ask a certifier about because I, it's not quite as stringent as like FSA maps, but part of your organic systems plan is also maps of your production fields. And so is the certifier willing to, to take out to the area that was accidentally sprayed or would they wanna take that whole, you know, field out of compliance with, which if it's a 120 acre field and only 10 acres got sprayed, that's potentially a lot of money lost if you're talking about $30 <coughs> with greater organic sweetings. Okay, so now the dicamba thing, that has caused a lot of heartbreak um, in the organic world. And initially, like the first two years, you had a lot of organic farmers getting a lot of acres taken out of production if there were any signs of drift. Um, but because dicamba is so prone to drift and also, you know, issues with people not using the appropriate products and creating more problems. Um, I haven't, I don't think, you know, if there's a touch of a symptom on a field, those being taken out of compliance. Um, but the question about residue te testing is really interesting. So if there's any suspicion or confirmation of something being accidentally sprayed, definitely should be taken out of compliance. The drift question, um, I mean, you do have some organic farmers, excuse me, <clears throat> that would self take that out. I mean, they're just, they feel strongly enough about the representation of the product that they might willingly say, well, that got drifted on, I won't sell it as organic. Um, they may or may not then tell the certifier and um, I guess I don't know if that's true. So does but, it all kind of depend on if they tell, like they, suspect it or? They tell. Tell, yeah, you I'd say you'd want to tell you because you're running You don't want to lose your whole field if it accidentally got contaminated. Yeah, yeah. They're really easy to deal with your inspectors. Yeah, but so then the residue question is an uh, interesting one because so organic certifiers for the most part don't do residue testing. Like they might, like if they suspect, you know, if you say I'm a lifelong organic farmer and then the inspector, you know, walking around the farm with me finds in the shed, 2,4-D or dicamba or glyphosate, then they might want to do some residue testing in my stuff. And they can do that. Um, but in general, certifiers aren't pulling samples to take, you know, out of bins to take residue samples. But you do have a lot of organic buyers that will. And so, 
and and that's a whole kind of another conversation but a lot of um organic sales are done if not direct to your end user i mean it's it's direct contracting and there will be specs with residues so you'd be submitting a sample beforehand anyways okay, thank you yeah thanks but the drift question is is really messy unfortunately <laughs>